Um, it seems like we lost Zainul again. Uh, hang on a minute. <laughs> it's giving me a call. Hello, Zainul. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Zainul. Uh, today uh, I'm from the School of Chemical and Energy Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, New City of Malaysia. Uh, today uh, we're going to have our next uh, Distinguished Lecture Series, which is being organized uh, by the Faculty of Engineering UTM, FE UTM. Uh, today uh, we are very fortunate and grateful to have the presence of uh, Professor Long Yim from UTS, University of Technology, Sydney, uh, with us today with this topic on bioengineering and on something on carbon capture and resource recovery from water and wastewater. So uh, a little bit of background on our uh, earlier uh, engagement or involvement with uh, Professor Long. Uh, Professor Long, I think, have, been, have come to UTM last time into 2014 to attend one conference, which being hosted by UTM uh, way back in 2014. So after that, uh, we did meet uh, in a couple of conference uh, uh, abroad. So uh, I think our most recent uh, engagement is uh, when we were together in uh, in the publication process of one manuscript, which uh, Alhamdulillah has been published uh, with uh, Springer. So hopefully we're going to see a lot more collaborations with uh, UTS in 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 the in the future. Yeah. So with that very brief uh, introduction, uh, allow me to pass the session to our distinguished dean, uh, Professor Rafiq, uh, to make uh, to introduce our speaker today. Over to you, bro. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zainal. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome, everyone, to our 110th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq, and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Long Yem from University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Prof uh, Professor Long Yem is the director of the Center for Technology in Water and Waste Water and a professor in environmental engineering at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering University of Technology, Sydney. The overarching aim of his work was to, is to discover, develop and transfer new knowledge, skills and technologies that improve the provision of clean water and purification of wastewater in service to society. Prior to joining UTS, he received a research training and experience from the University of New South Wales, Yale University in the US, University of Melbourne and the University of Wollongong. In 2009, he was a visiting professor at Colorado School of Mines. In May and June 2016, he was an August William Schier visiting professor at the Technical University of Munich, Germany. To date, he has supervised to completion 20 PhD and 8 MPhil students and have overseen the delivery of numerous research projects with over $3 million in funding. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Long Yem from University of Technology, Sydney, Australia, with a lecture entitled Bioengineering for Carbon Capture and Resource Recovery from Waste and Wastewater. Professor Long Yem, over to you. Thank you, Professor Rafik. And, um... I would also like to um, thank my friend, Professor um, Zainun, for um, extending the invitation to me. And I thank all of you for giving me um, some of the time to share with you um, about um, my and our recent research work in the area of uh, energy resource recovery and um, carbon capture as well. Um, so I'd like to go straight into my presentation. Um, I like to introduce a little bit about my old university um, and the Center for Technology in um, Water and Waste Water. And, and then I talk um, uh, um, briefly about my research work. Um, after that, I'd like to um, present you a snapshot of three areas that um, I have been quite passionate about. Um, they are in energy recovery through co-digestion, 
um, and a small research um, work that um, we are working right now and have just got a publication in um, nutrient recovery from wastewater. And toward the end, um, I talked to you about our current work on the micro algae platform that I think would have a huge potential um, for the bioeconomy um, sector um, to capture resources, um, to capture, to generate energy, and also to capture carbon. Um, so a bit of uh, info about my university. Um, Professor Rafit, um, is my presentation on the screen at the moment? Uh, no, not yet. You haven't shared your PowerPoint file. You, you shared, uh, yeah, okay. I, I shared before, but I think it um, hasn't been taken up. Ah, okay, that's good. Excellent. Right. Now yeah, we can see. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, so um, I'd like to just take um, two or three minutes at the beginning to talk a bit about um, University of Technology Sydney. Um, our university, very young, is um, about 25 years old, so is um, one of the youngest university in Australia, um, but we have done very well um, in research as well as um, training to our students. So we currently rank number 133 in the world, according to QS ranking. Um, and um, we rank number one among the under 50 years old university in Australia. And um, in the world that would be number 10. Um, we focus very much on um, technology and how technology can transform life and um, improve life quality for people. So um, it's a very technology driven university. Having said that, it is also a comprehensive university where we have a um, degree in various other aspects. Um, but um, the cutting edge of um, research and training at uh, UTS is in around technology, engineering, and, um, and, and information technology, or IT. Um, and um, we actually lo located um, at um, the um, central business district of uh, Sydney. So if you um, come to, to Sydney, um, I'd like to invite you to um, visit UTS. It's a very convenient location right at the center of the um, city. Um, so within UTS, um, we have a few flagship research centers, um, and we have been very fortunate to be one of them. The Center for Technology in Water and Wastewater. Um, our center focuses very much on um, the any aspects that relate to um, water and broad, broadly, broadly to the environment as well. Um, we have a team of 25 full-time academics as core member of the center. Um, we have many more associate members as well. Um, at the moment, we have um, close to 80 PhD students, and every year we deliver about 3 million in um, research um, project, uh, um, in, in research value. Um, we publish um, close to 200 journal papers a year. Um, and um, we also have a very strong portfolio of, um, of high performing um, researchers and academics. Many of us are um, uh, editors or editor-in-chief in, um, in top-tier journals in the field of um, environmental engineering and environmental science. Um, I myself, as probably um, some of you know, um, uh, an editor of the Journal of Membrane Science. Um, Professor Hao, um, who is also in our center, is, the, is an editor of uh, Bioresource Technology, Professor Sean. Uh, who is uh, another deputy director, is uh, an editor in Decentralization. Um, so we have a very um, strong team within our research center. And um, we focus on very much four key areas. Um, we focus on water reuse and desonization, um, sustainable wastewater treatment. Um, that is a focus on resource recovery from waste and wastewater. We also work on technology to purify and recover critical minerals, uh, such as um, rare earth metals and um, lithium um, during mineral processing, as well as for uh, recovering those metals from um, waste material. And another 
area that are related directly to um, the um, water environment is in um, catchment management and um, hydraulic and hydrology. Our core research mission is very much to transform um, the current um, practice um, to um, have um, um, an improved life quality um, center around the water, energy, and food nexus. Um, water is obviously the key center, but um, the, the center of what we are doing, but um, we are very mindful about um, the energy and therefore we do a lot of work in the area. area. So th there are the four area of impacts and um, we deliver those impacts through our capability um, in um, nanotechnology. So we have a team who can fabricate membrane, uh, fabricate um, nanoparticles for environmental application. Um, we also look at um, high-end analytical chemistry. Um, we also have cap capability in um, bio, uh, in molecular biology. Um, we can do um, DNA sequencing and we can through DNA sequencing and other uh, metagenomic tools um, characterize the microbial community of our biological reactor um, and, and um, optimize um, the process. Um, we do a lot of work at, um, at our lab and then we transfer it and, up, um, and scale it up to pilot um, level um, and then hand over to the industry. So energy impact is also very important um, at the back of our head. So that's a very quick snapshot about UTS and the Center for Technology in Water and West Quarter. Um, if it is okay, I'd like to just briefly talk a bit about my own research. So um, I myself have um, four research areas that is a subset of what I described within the center just now. Um, I have done some work in the removal of um, trace organic contaminants for water reuse through nanofiltration membrane, reverse osmosis membrane, membrane bioreactor, and um, other advanced oxidation processes. Um, recently, I moved more to uh, uh, anaerobic digestion, so looking at um, recovery of um, energy from organic waste and waste water. Um, I also developed a capability in microbial characterization, mostly through um, initially DNA sequencing and then later on uh, metagenomic and um, other molecular biolo um, biology techniques to better understand um, the uh, microbial um, community and the individual um, um, phylum or, or genera in the um, biological reactor. Um, over the last, uh, I would say two years ago, um, two, two, two years or so, um, I have opened up um, a new research area looking at microalgae, um, which I would like to um, discuss a bit in my presentation because I believe that uh, microalgae is an excellent platform to resolve some of the burning issues that we have um, globally. Um, so let me now provide some, oh, um, actually I, I also want to um, perhaps share with you my research philosophy as well. Um, we do a lot of work in the lab. Um, we look at um, fundamental research discovery, um, but we also um, mindful of the need to translate our research to um, the industry. So we have engaged on the way from proof of concept in the lab to pilot testing and then hand over to the industry. So the talk that um, I'm going to share with you today, uh, you can see a combination of um, lab work as well as pilot um, study. Um, um, we're very mindful that pilot study is, is very um, resource demanding. We spend a lot of time and um, we only collect a few data points and um, we don't usually generate a lot of publications from pilot study, but they are essential for uh, full-scale implementation and um, the practical impact of our research work. Um, so let me um, start um, sharing with you some of my um, um, current um, active research work. Um, Within the 45 minutes time frame we have, um, I'll only be able to um, provide a few examples. Um, and the three examples I have selected for today talk are all related to bioengineering. Um, the first one is um, 
my work to recover energy from west and west quarter um, through anaerobic um, cold digestion. So we started this work um, some years ago, and the driver is very much to look at way for the water industry in Australia to become energy neutral. Further than that, we also recognize the fact that eventually we will run out of fossil fuel, and we would need to substitute on the raw material that currently come from fossil fuel by something else, and that something else would most likely to be a bio resource. I think that we can get from renewable um, sources. Um, and um, that, that is important for us in the long run. Um, and if we can um, get bio resources such as um, biomethane, um, then from biomethane, we can then um, produce um, plastic, we can produce um, own sort of material that um, eventually substitute for uh, fossil fuel. So that's the driver we have. And where do we get um, methane from? We can actually get it from biogas, which is readily um, available from any organic material. Um, in in Australia, in Sydney, we have a number of wastewater treatment plants that already generate biogas through the anaerobic digestion of wastewater sludge. We can do even better by combining wastewater sludge with um, um, organic waste, and we can therefore potentially increase the um, the production of, of biogas. So the process is um, is relatively well understood. The part that is not well understood is uh, what happens when we do coal digestion. Um, how can we move it from a left scale um, system uh, or left scale um, uh, activity into full scale implementation, knowing that um, the full scale plan uh, would have to operate constantly and without any disruption. Um, that basically one of our motivation. The other motivation we have is we see the economic value in core digestion. Um, sewer sludge is very rich in nutrient, but it's, it's usually very lean in, in carbon source. And at the same time, within the urban area, um, we have a long list of organic waste that are very rich in carbon. Now, if we look at wastewater treatment, uh, at least in the context of Australia or Sydney, we already have a very well established network of um, facilities that is um, geographically well distributed. Disasters are already available and they are limited very much by the hydraulic loading because the low carbon content in sewage sludge. And when we did the theoretical calculation, at the minimum, we would have about 20% spare capacity in organic loading. That means we can add more organic into the disaster um, as long as um, that organic is concentrated and we don't have to um, increase the hydraulic loading. Um, if we can do so, then we can generate more biogas very much with very, very little capital investment, so we don't have to build a brand new anaerobic disaster. That's very much the, um, the economic driver um, from our energy partner who is Sydney Water. So we pair up with um, Sydney Water looking at way in which we can um, explore anaerobic digestion, called anaerobic co digestion, so that we can generate more energy and potentially become energy neutral. And that would also be a way to mitigate the fugitive, uh, fugitive um, greenhouse emission into the atmosphere. Um, we started um, with a um, uh, lab scale study and some um, computer simulation pilot and then full scale um, implementation. And so far, we have got um, the work implemented at um, two treatment plants. And I'm going to um, walk you through. Um, the work that uh, led to those two uh, full-scale implementation. The first um, project is when we look at um, the co-digestion of um, glycerol and sludge. Um, so that give you a, a, a brief background about um, glycerol. Glycerol is a byproduct from biodiesel production. So we have a fair bit of biodiesel production in Australia. For every nine liter of biodiesel produced, um, we end up with one liter 
glycerol. Now, this is very low quality glycerol. It's very high in carbon, with very low quality. It's not poor glycerol, and therefore we cannot use it for um, high end application like the cosmetic industry. Um, it's come to us um, at very much zero cost. Um, we don't have to pay for it, but um, we don't get any money from um, taking it. Um, however, it generates a lot of biogas, and I, I'd like to demonstrate it in um, the next few slides. So we started with a um, um, computer simulation um, exercise where I use BioWin, which is a software that allows us to simulate the generation of biogas um, through an anaerobic digestion process. Our aim here is to see if we can use glycerone to generate more biogas, and not to generate more biogas, but also to match the energy demand with gas generation. Um, if you ever work at any industrial um, plants, um, at any industrial plant, you will probably um, recognize that there's usually a diurnal um, energy demand, where the energy demand usually highest during the day and uh, a bit lower during the night. For wastewater treatment facility, uh, we also have the up and down energy demand, and um, it is follow a similar pattern, and it's also influenced by when we turn on all of our pump and motor. What we want to do is to be able to generate more biogas, and the biogas will then go into a cogen um, co engine to produce electricity instantaneously to match with the demand. So the simulation we have show us that um, there's a very small lag time of um, third about four hours between the injection of glycerol into the disaster and when we see um, sufficient amount of biogas being generated. That's the really good news for us because with that we can inject some glycerol into the um, disaster to co-digest with sludge and we can time it in a way that we can match the energy demand. Now, they did computer simulation, so the data is very clean. Um, we then move on to do the same thing, uh, but using a pilot system. So the system we actually set up at the Bondi treatment plant. Um, it's a 50 liter reactor. We inject um, glycerol and um, we, we check when we have maximum biogas production. Um, the data you see that uh, is uh, it's not as clean as in computer simulation, um, but the data also very consistent with um, computer simulation. We see a lag time um, of about four hours. That means we know that four hours before we see the peak demand in energy, we should um, start um, injecting glycerol into the system. Um, there's a lot more work behind the project, and I only um, show you some of the data here. The other thing that we have done is to um, work out what is the maximum amount of glycerol that we can inject into the system. Apparently, we cannot inject too much glycerol because glycerol have a extremely high um, CO2 or um, um, chemical oxygen demand content, meaning very high carbon content. So if we put too much um, glycerol into the disaster, um, we overload the disaster. So the, the maximum um, volume percentage of uh, glycerol we can inject is only um, 3%. Um, we then make a recommendation to the plan to inject less than 1%. Um, after we completed the pilot um, study, the plan, um, um, the, the Bondi wastewater treatment plan, treatment plan have started to um, pump glycerol into the digester. Um, as soon as they started, um, they start um, um, energy auditing um, exercise. And um, after they finished the auditing exercise, um, they came back and report that they have um, generated 13% more electricity than consumption. Um, so it become the first um, treatment plant to become uh, a net um, energy production in Australia. So right after that um, project, um, we then um, got funding from the Australian Research Council 
um, to scale up our research further and looking at other waste material. Um, so as part of the additional project that funded by the Australian Research Council, um, where we would need to um, basically be the guinea pig per se um, to work out what are the bottlenecks, what are the trouble that um, we are likely to encounter when we um, implement co-digestion of other types of organic waste um, with um, wastewater sludge. Um, so um, in the second phase of the project, we build a pilot um, anaerobic digester. Um, it's much larger than the first pilot that we have used at the Bondi plant. It's actually um, in a shipping container, as you see here on the picture. And inside the shipping container, um, we have um, two reactors running uh, in parallel. Each reactor is, uh, uh, is 1,000 liter in volume. Um, the reason why we set up two reactors is because we want to have one reactor running as the control reactor and the second reactor, um, we call it reactor A. Um, it will be a co digestion reactor. Uh, reactor B is the control reactor. Um, we designed it by ourselves. Um, it is fully um, SCADA compared, um, it have a, a full SCADA capability and um, we can um, also um, remotely connect into the um, pilot um, plan and um, monitor as well as um, control the, the plan uh, from anywhere where we have access to the internet. And we installed the plan at um, the Shell Harbor treatment plant. So it um, takes um, sludge directly from the um, Shell Harbor um, treatment plant. And we work with Sydney Water. So they gave us a list of, um, of organic waste that um, we can commercially secure at a volume that would be suitable for full-scale implementation. Um, they very much uh, food waste uh, from the um, um, urban area. So this is food waste from commercial kitchen and restaurant. This is not food waste from individual household. So the quality of uh, material is, is more consistent. Um, as you can see here in the, um, let me see if I can show you the, um, yeah, I think I can show you the laser pointer. Um, the food waste we have is from a commercial kitchen and it um, run through um, a, a macerator that installed on site. So um, um, whenever the, the chef have some um, food waste, um, they can then put it into the macerator and they add a tiny bit of water, uh, close the lid, and the macerator will then uh, grind the material into a paste. So what we end up with is a paste um, that um, have very high organic content. Uh, it's, it's then um, stored in a stainless steel vessel, and then the truck would come in um, every three days to chuck it away and then bring it to um, the treatment plant for, for, for um, cold digestion. We also collect um, liquid waste. Um, liquid waste is very much a uh, soft drink, uh, pre-mixed beer, red wine, fruit juice. Um, you might wonder why we have such um, high value materials. Um, in fact, we actually end up um, having a significant volume of deep, um, liquid waste for various reasons. Um, they are out of date, um, they have been contaminated, they have, the packaging has been damaged and therefore we have to destroy them. Um, we have a commercial waste collector and um, we have already determined that the volume of this waste is um, suitable for um, large scale commercial application. Um, you did a quick picture to show where the food waste we, we get um, is from. Um, it's actually from um, a very um, highly um, populated um, area um, called Barongaru in, in Sydney. It is uh, very much um, the center of Sydney. You can see uh, Sydney Opera, Opera House here. Um, you can see Sydney Opera House here and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, and in the basement of the building, um, we basically have the um, food waste collection facility. Um, so the, the quality is consistent and uh, we have a large volume. So let me show you some data from our pilot um, um, evaluation and, and, and pilot study. 
I mentioned to you before, we have two reactors running in parallel. Reactor A is the cold digestion reactor and reactor B is the control. Um, when we started, um, we want to make sure that the two reactors show the same uh, performance. And indeed, um, this graph um, show that uh, you see the same amount of biogas being generated from both A and B, uh, reactor A and reactor B. Um, and then when we do cold digestion, we can see more biogas being generated from the cold digestion reactor, and um, which is reactor A. Um, so this is a snapshot of uh, how the data look like. Obviously, we have to uh, integrate the data in, in a lot more detail. Um, we look at um, various aspects of um, cold digestion. So one thing we look at is what we call the specific methane yield. Um, so the amount of methane uh, generated per kilogram of COD input into the um, reactor. And you can see that uh, in terms of uh, specific methane yield, um, cold digestion doesn't change the specific methane yield that much, um, and we anticipate that. The only exception is perhaps um, Lewis, fruit Lewis, where we see significantly higher specific methane yield, and uh, we, uh, we attribute that to um, potentially um, the synergistic effect when we have um, fruit Lewis with um, provide better nutrient content to the reactor. We also see a uh, among the few um, uh, organic waste material that we're looking at, we also see a problem with um, grape wine and uh, did red wine. So apparently when we um, call the red wine with um, serious sludge, um, we see a collapse of our reactor. Um, and that is because um, grape wine have a lot of um, uh, polyphenol uh, which is toxic to the uh, mic uh, to the microbe, and it also have um, a very high um, sulfur content, um, which is also toxic to the microbe. So the pilot study, um, one of the outcome of the pilot study is that we have to exclude grape wine from the um, organic waste material for cold digestion. Um, so the specific methane yield doesn't change that much, but we can see that the volume of biogas being generated is proportional to the organic loading rate, which is um, very much what we expect. And we also see the maximum organic loading rate um, at about four kilograms per um, cubic meter per day, per cubic meter of reactor per day, as what we can um, go up to. Um, we also see that in terms of biogas quality, when we do cold digestion, we tend to have better biogas quality. So I, the um, percentage of, um, of methane in biogas increased slightly during cold digestion. And that is because we, um, we have more um, carbon content in the feed. B, we also see lower H2S, which is um, an impurity in biogas, which is um, very problematic when we want to utilize biogas. Lower H2S is also good. Um, by the way, during um, this um, research, we also come up with a very um, interesting and, and low-cost technique to uh, minimize the formation of hydrogen sunfit or H2S in biogas. But um, I don't think I have enough time, so I will not um, talk about that part. But if you are interested in our um, technique to control the formation of hydrogen sunfit in biogas, what we call macro aeration. Um, please contact me and I am more than happy to share with you our um, research um, result um, and our research work. Um, there's a few other things that we look at and um, I, I feel that um, we might not have enough time so I um, exclude it, but I want to mention it to you. We also look at the waterability and there's no problem with the waterability. Um, we also look at the biosolid content, the, the biosolid quality, um, and the stratification uh, in the reactor. Um, when we finish the pilot um, for each um, organic waste, we then hand over and um, we start the implementation. So we have then, um, since then, implemented um, anaerobic co at the 
quinona plant. And the result from our pilot uh, study have been very useful. And when we do um, full-scale implementation, we were able to avoid most of the problems that um, likely to occur during um, full-scale implementation. We also see some new problems that we were not able to intercept during our pilot testing. Um, but we, we, we then uh, follow up and, and um, have our energy partner, Sydney Water, to rezone them. Um, and again, if you are interested, I can share some more results with you uh, as well. Um, please contact me. Um, so the first part is about um, energy um, recovery from um, organic waste and, and wastewater through anaerobic digestion. One, we have the biogas. It's another interesting proposition, at least in the Australian um, context. Um, that is, um, um, how do we utilize biogas? We have done some work on um, biogas upgrade. Um, so if you are interested in biogas upgrade, um, please let, let me know and I can share some, um, some of our recent publication with you. Um, now, when we look at anaerobic digestion, we would um, have basically three outputs. One is biogas, which I have already discussed, and then the slurry, we separate the slurry into sludge sandwich, which is a liquid part, and normally sent back to the treatment um, plant that have a very high nutrient content, and then the bowel solid. The nutrient content is what we are interested in. So um, I have a very um, smart PhD student who is working on nutrient recovery. Um, we have published a few um, um, publication showing our results on this area. And I'd like to um, talk to you about the latest piece of um, work that um, we have just published a few days ago. So again, if you look at um, a normal wastewater treatment plan, um, you're probably very familiar with, um, with the typical um, flow sheet from primary treatment to biological treatment. Um, and you have the sludge and the sludge go into an anaerobic disaster and then you dewater the sludge, you have the sand jet and the sand jet go back to the head of work and the bowel solid go to land application. Now the sludge sand jet here have a very high nutrient content, nutrient here are phosphorus and nitrogen. So basically um, autophosphate and um, usually um, ammonia. By recirculating the nutrient back to the head of work, we uh, would um, potentially um, create um, a situation where we can have build up of um, nutrient in the system. So uh, uh, a good way to deal with it is to um, recover the nutrient. At this point, it's very rich and uh, the, the, the liquid volume is, is also pretty small. And we can recover that as um, Struvai or as calcium phosphorus. So there are a number of commercial um, processes for nutrient recovery already, but most of them go into uh, pre um, chemical precipitation, which is not very high in efficiency. Um, we then look at membrane filtration. The problem with membrane filtration is, is, is fouling. And uh, in, in order to deal with fouling, we need to introduce a new membrane process called forward osmosis. And when we use forward osmosis, we'll be able to concentrate the uh, phosphorus and the ammonia to a point where we can easily drop them out as um, either struvite or calcium phosphorus. So um, if you look at my publication list, um, there have been a number of um, stu uh, 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 um, studies that I have published in, in this area. The problem, though, is when we use forward osmosis, um, we end up with um, two problems. One problem is we need to think about um, the generation of draw solution. Now we can resolve that problem, um, at least in the context of Australia, and I guess in Malaysia, you can also deal with that quite effectively using seawater as a draw solution. So if the treatment plant is close enough to the ocean, you can just use seawater as a draw solution. And seawater will um, when, when suck clean water through the FO membrane and enrich the nutrient content. So problem number one is resolved. 
However, when you, you see water as a draw solution, in the forward osmosis process, we have another problem that we need to resolve. That is the bidirectional transport of solute, and in this case, it's mostly hydroxyl or OH minus. Now, OH minus um, basically results in the increase of pH in the sludge, in the remaining sludge sandwich. And when the the pH value increases, you end up with um, calcium phosphorus precipitation on the membrane surface, and calcium phosphorus pre precipitation on the membrane surface cause two problems. One is membrane fouling, and two is the loss of nutrient because instead of recovering that calcium phosphorus, it's now sit on our membrane surface and um, it, 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 it's not recoverable. So the problem, the key problem here is pH. And when we look at the pH problem, we then realize that, hey, in the anaerobic digestion process, we have biogas. And in biogas, we have about 40% CO2, and CO2 is actually a brilliant ingredient to buffer the um, sludge sentient so that the pH doesn't increase, and therefore we wouldn't have the um, precipitation problem. So we take that approach um, forward. Um, we set up our system. So here we do a um, core digestion process. We have an um, anaerobic um, digester. Um, it is um, left scale, but it's relatively large left scale. So the reactor here is 30 liter in, in size. And in order to generate um, a sufficient um, volume of biogas, we actually do core digestion. And as I presented to you early on, various quests. So we went to the um, Kununa plant. We get the, um, the, the um, waste material from, from them, which Normally they use it in that process, but we that, um, get um, some back to the outlet and the sewer sludge is also from the Kunula plant. So we then um, channel that biogas and diffuse that biogas through the sludge sandwich and um, we use forward osmosis membrane to um, enrich the um, nutrient content in the sludge sandwich. So basically, we combine forward osmosis with uh, biogas sparging so that we can buffer the sludge sandwich um, in an integrated system. So let's look at the, the results here. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the normalized flux. When you do not have uh, biogas sparging, the flux go to zero after um, the water recovery have reached. 60%. And when we sparge the sludge sandwich with biogas, we have higher flux. Now the flux continue to decline. Um, it, it doesn't um, stay constant. The decline here is because A, we have a diluted draw solution. So over the time that the draw solution become diluted. And B, uh, we still have a bit of fouling on the membrane surface. But clearly, when we sparge the, the um, sludge sandwich with biogas so that we can enrich the nutrient content in the sludge sandwich, we see a lot less fouling. More importantly, if you go to the right-hand side figure, you see flush recovery after we flush the membrane surface by the physical flushing. So on, all we do is that flush the membrane surface. Um, so we didn't remove the membrane from the membrane cell. We simply replace the fish solution with a tap um, water, um, with tap water, and then run tap water over the membrane surface. By that fi simple physical flushing, when we have um, biogas sparging, we were able to recover almost 90% of the flux. Whereas when we did not use any biogas, we could only recover less than 50% of the flux. So A, fouling were less, B, the flux were um, very, very um, recoverable. When we look at the amount of um, nutrient, namely phosphorus and ammonia that we can recover, we can also see a, a very distinct advantage. So the graph here I show you is the theoretical recovery. So assume that um, I can recover um, all the K 
carbon, all the all the carbon, all the phosphate, and all the um, ammonia um, in the sludge sanchet, um, you can do a mass balance, and this would be the theoretical value. When we do not have um, biogas parching, we have a lot of precipitation directly on the membrane surface. And therefore, you see that for phosphate, you have a significant deviation from the experimental value, which is a triangle here, and the theoretical limit, which is the blue circle. And you see the same thing for ammonia. The only set of data that you see where experimental data closely resemble the theoretical limit is for carbon content in the slush sanction. Now, did it without any biogas parching? And this is because of precipitation on the membrane surface. So when we sparge the slush sanction with, with biogas, we effectively buffer the slush sanction, and we were able to reduce the effectively eliminate the pre precipitation on the membrane surface. And therefore, you see that the red um, data set here resemble the theoretical limit very well. So we were able to recover most of the phosphate and most of the ammonia um, when we do um, um, biogas patching. So um, this is something that we are quite excited about because biogas is already there. It's very convenient. Um, we, we get biogas and slash sanchet at the same time. All we need to do is that um, do a bit of pressure fitting so that we can channel the biogas through the slash sanchet. Um, some might ask the question, so what about the loss of methane gas into the slash sanchet? The answer would be it is negligible because the slash sanchet is from the anaerobic disaster, so it's already... Um, so it's already... Um, uh, saturated with uh, methane gas and the solubility of methane gas in water is very low but anyway it's only about 20 milligram per liter so it's not a big problem. Um, we can also confirm the effectiveness of um, biogas patching for uh, controlling fouling using um, SEM analysis so without uh, biogas patching you see a very thick layer uh, very amorphous Fouling layer on the membrane surface. When we sparge it with biogas, we do not see any amorphous fouling on the membrane surface. Instead, we see some crystal on the membrane surface. So, it indicates that um, fouling is a lot less, but it also indicates that uh, eventually we will need to work our way to um, also um, prevent those small crystal from forming on the membrane surface. So as a quick um, conclusion, um, this is a very convenient technique to apply and utilize what we already have in the anaerobic digestion process to um, better recover um, nutrient um, as phosphorus and ammonia from sludge sanchet. Um, and um, the paper was accepted last week, so it's it, um, very, um, very, very recent. Um, I'd like to move to the last part of um, my talk today, um, something that I'm very excited about, um, which is to talk about the microalgae platform uh, for um, carbon capture and biochemical production. Um, I, I um, had a, a discussion with Professor Rafit um, about the audience, and I understand that the audience is, is quite um, diverse. Um, so. I might talk a bit about why we are looking at microalgae. Uh, so basically, microalgae is um, it, it, um, it's a long list of species that would grow under sunlight and whenever you have um, water and a bit of nutrient. They grow very fast. And um, they can be problematic in the wild. Um, so you, you might hurt um, a, um harmful um, green blue algae bloom. Um, but in fact, most of microalgae we have are very useful microalgae. From microalgae, you can um, convert the, 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 the biochemical that you harvest from microalgae into, um, 
into um, food additives, into cosmetic products. Uh, you can even um, um, produce beer from microalgae. Um, so there's the uh, microalgae beer. Um, we here in at UTS work with um, young Henry, um, and and they're very interested in using microalgae to absorb um, CO2 to offset the CO2 emission from the production process as well to pro to produce um, microalgae beer. Um, the advantage of microalgae are, are numerous. Um, so basically, they grow very fast. Um, and they can uptake CO2 about 400 times more efficient than cheese um, because they individual cell and they grow very, very fast. And they can grow wherever you have um, sunlight and um, it doesn't take anything else. You don't need to have soil. You don't need to have um, um, fertile land in order to grow algae. So you can actually grow uh, micro algae um, on the desert or on the ocean surface. Um, all you need is um, CO2 input into the microalgae solution, um, nutrient from wastewater and, and sunlight. Um, so a really, really good platform. The problem though is in um, two areas. One is microalgae harvesting. Uh, it's actually very challenging to harvest microalgae. Um, when you reach um, maturity, um, you would have um, basically um, a solution with um, a, a content of usually about one kilogram of microalgae biomass per cubic meter, which is one in, in, in a thousand, which is very low. And you, you need to separate the water from the microalgae. Um, and two is in the production bread. Um, even though microalgae grow very fast, it absorbs CO2 uh, 400 times high. Um, uh, more than, than plants, um, but it is still a biological process. So it is um, relatively um, um, slow um, for engineering application. So we look at the two problems separately, um, and I already have some good solution for the first problem. Uh, in the first problem, it's very challenging to um, harvest microalgae. That is because microalgae, by nature, they are individual cells most of the time. Um, they are negatively charged, and by nature, they want to stay in suspension in the um, solution so that they can absorb sunlight. If they um, aggregate together, they will not be able to access to sunlight, and therefore, they would always try to repel each other, stay individually, negatively charged, and very small. Um, Current technique to harvest microalgae are problematic because they rely on either centrifugation or membrane um, filtration. Both centrifugation and membrane filtration is against nature. So we try to push negatively charged microalgae cells together. And because they're negatively charged, they repel each other. We see that as um, as um, something we can easy, we, we can address using our um, innovative polymer. So, um, in order to put to put all the agri microalgae together, we realize that first thing we need to do is to neutralize the charge. So we then make a polymer that is um, highly positively charged, and we also have a very high molecular weight uh, polymer. So we then come up with a polymer that acts like a fish net, where the positively charge would neutralize the charge of the um, microalgae, and the high molecular weight acts like a, a, a fish net to pull all the microalgae together. So by that adding a tiny bit of um, polymer that we have made into the microalgae solution, we can effectively coagulate. Um, on the polymer together, so the harvesting. Um, cost is, is very low compared to the traditional approach of using either membrane filtration or uh, centrifugation. And we have tested um, our polymer using um, a long list of um, microalgae, um, um, both freshwater microalgae and, and marine microalgae. And they all work um, pretty well. 
Um, so we, we now have um, a process where we, we could um, scale it up. And in fact, um, we have now got the first prototype of a micro algae harvester, um, which I show you here. Um, it is not a commercial product. It is um, a system that we design ourselves and um, we outsource the fabrication to a workshop here in Sydney to harvest um, micro algae on a continuous basis. So we have a um, 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 polymer dosing system on the other side and, and it that works continuously to um, recover the polymer for us. Um, what we have done here is um, basically um, at some tiny bit of polymer, the dosage is very small. If you look at the dosage, you can see that um, we only need about um, 15 to 50 um, sorry, 15 to about 20 uh, milligram of, of polymer per gram of dry biomass. That work out to be like um, 20 gram per kilogram. Um, so a uh, tiny bit of polymer, yes. Long, sorry. sorry. Um, we are running, really running out of, of time. We have around three to four minutes left. Maybe you can go to your conclu concluding uh, slide, maybe? Yeah. Um, can you give me about three minutes? I'm going to fast track it. Sure, sure. And, um, I don't want to show everyone a very short video how effective our polymer is. Okay, it doesn't work. I don't know. I checked it last time, but this time it doesn't work. Um, well, the other part that we have also done is to um, look at microalgae as a platform for uptaking nutrient from wastewater produce microalgae biomass um, and it turned out to be very effective um, so i'm very mindful of the time limits so i'm going to come to the final um, point here it's another part that we are working on and um, unfortunately i've been told by the university not to do any presentation is to use microalgae as a intensified process to absorb co2 so we have some um, Industry um, partnership, and therefore I have not been able to share the data with you. But I'm very hopeful that um, in the near future I'll be able to share with you the the um, data uh, where we use um, a, a new intensifying um, agro reactor to capture CO2. Um, so um, we're supported by. Um, a very modern microalgae test bed. Um, so this is the facility in the picture here, this facility that we have in our lab. Um, and uh, I think it is a, a really flexible and useful platform um, to use microalgae to capture CO2, produce biochemical, and uh, at the same time harvest the nutrient from wastewater. Um, so I know time is up, and I'd, I'd like to get some um, time for the Q&A section if there's any question. Uh, thank you, Zainu. Thank you very much, Long, for your very informative uh, sharing. Yeah. Um, have you closed down your uh, PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, because uh, if there's any question, maybe the secretary can just post it so that you can read on, on your screen. So um, let's wait for any questions from our audience, if there's any. Uh, while waiting, Long, no problem. I have two questions here. Uh, somebody, yeah. one of my colleagues uh, personally uh, WhatsApp me. So one is uh, the deputy director of one um, research center over here. They are focusing, the, the center is focusing on environmental sustainability and also resource recovery. So actually it's, it's not a question, it's just uh, an, an idea or a, a, a kind of thought, whether there is an opportunity for their center to, to work together uh, with your center in the area of uh, Holon. Uh, some hold on in the area of um, bio electrochemical reactor BEMR technology for water reuse and recycling, and also for uh, resource recovery and advanced treatment technology. Long, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we always welcome collaboration, uh, especially collaboration coming from Malaysia and, and from um, South Asia. Um, the few topics that you mentioned uh, well within our center research capability. Um, 
I, I deal with some of them, but I also have colleagues who deal with the rest. I um, you mentioned electro um, chemical um, electro bio remediation. Um, so we have colleagues who who you um, um, that technology to um, remediate heavy metal in um, in in um, in soil, for example. Um, so I think. Um, collaboration um, that to come back to that um, question um, we're very keen to collaborate um, and um, if the colleagues can drop me an email we can start um, exploring um, the possibility for collaboration um, it can take a number of shapes and form uh, could be um, student exchange um, and then gradually it can grow up to like joy project and, and, and the like and we have a number of mechanisms here to support collaborative research as well. Thank you very much, along with that, because uh, I was told by, by, by my colleague just now, they have just received a national grant as a national focus center on resource recovery. So with that, they also have some fund for mobility and uh, networking purpose. So I think, yeah, we, we, we can work something out. Yeah. So, yeah. Apart from that, there's just one question from uh, one of my colleagues about your study on uh, maybe uh, about the microbiome interaction in, in the biofilm system, maybe. Do you, do you study something on that? Yeah, I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question again? The question is, do, uh, do you or any of your researchers in your center study on a microbiome interaction in the biofilm system? Bio, bio, um, biofilter? Biofilm system, biofilm. Biofilm. Bio yeah. Biofilm in water and wastewater treatment. Biofilm. You mean biofilm? Biofilm, yeah. Yeah, biofilm. Yeah. yeah um, yes. Um, so um, I, I, I have not worked with um, a biofilm system before, but um, we look at um, microbial interaction within the reactor um quite extensively um so yes we um initially we use it in as um sequencing um to map the microbial community and then we look at the generation of the microbial community um under different um pressure vector um and, and that gives us an indication of how the microbial community respond to different environmental um, stress or environmental condition. Um, so I, I think we can exchange more information if the colleagues can get in touch with me and, and send me the specific question. Uh, yeah. But the broad answer would be yes, I, I think it seems that um, we, we do have some um, research activity in that area. Yeah, because uh, the, 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 my, the, my, my colleague, he is actually in, interested uh, in uh, handling the uh, sub water supply system. He, he is thinking of studying on a, uh, the uh, uh, quorum sensing approach. Yeah, yeah. Like, to target the cell uh, interaction between between individual and individual cells. So that we yeah. can mention the biofilm. Yeah. 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 Uh, we can we can um, readily. Um, um undertake that um, part um i'm very well aware of quorum sensing and if you have the signal chemical and you want to know how the microbial community respond to the signal sensor so you you introduce the signal sensor chemical into the biofilm and you want to study the biofilm community structure all you need to do is recharacterize the biofilm um, community structure so you take a dna you take the sample, you do the extraction, which is something we do routinely here. Uh, yeah. We have a sequencer here, and then we be sequencing the, the DNA sample. Um, we have um, bioinformatic analysis capability here. We can then reconstruct the microbial community. So you have a microbial community before you introduce the chemical signal, um, the, the, um, the, the, the uh, quorum sensing chemical and after you introduce the quorum sensing signal and you'll be able to then work out the interaction of the behavior okay great long um actually um we would like to accept more sharing from uh, utm staff researchers here 
um, some questions are coming in now. But uh, since we are really uh, out of time, because, uh, normally the session will end uh, around more or less an hour. Uh, we exceeded around six minutes. Um, so I think uh, we, uh, the take home point is that uh, we're really looking forward to have collaborations with UTI, especially with your center, because uh, in all your topics you just now, we have dedicated and readily researchers who are working with uh, uh, water, we have center for that, who are working with membrane. We have a national uh, high high performing center for that. And for microalgae, we have a dedicated research group for that here in UDM. So hopefully after this, we can exchange some emails um, to further uh, explore on the abilities available. Yeah. So now with that, I would like to extend uh, our sincere from our dean, Professor Rafiq. Uh, he, he, he told me you know, he, he cannot be here at this uh, time because he has some other commitments. So on behalf of uh, engineering, and also uh, all of you yeah, again, uh, thank you very much yeah, for allocating your precious time to be with us today. And hopefully we can uh, be together in other uh, occasions in, in the future. And also for our audience out there, uh, wherever you are, stay tuned for more uh, sharing from Faculty of Engineering UTM. Until then, thank you very much and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ryan, and thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you.